USDA, every five years, our federal government, the USDA and Health and Human Services, they put together the uh, dietary guidelines for Americans. Every five years they do that. So they just finished that up in 2015. Here's the, here was their schedule, what you got on the screen from, from this last year in 2015. This is a basically a four-year process, so it takes that whole five years. They put together, based on the current administration, they put together a group of experts in nutrition, and th that group gets together and scours the most recent research, and that's the Dietary uh, Guidelines Advisory Committee. And they are, they're literally experts in their field, and they scour this information, and at the end of it, they come out with a scientific report. That's this scientific uh, guideline that they're going to report to the USDA and the Health and Human Services to put out the recommendation for what we should eat as Americans. And maybe some of you know about that, but probably where it's most effective is in nursing homes or for kids in school, school lunch programs, um, institution, institutional programs like that. So the report came out, and this was the advice of the dietary guidelines, this, the, the, the experts, that they, they did something a little different. So they looked at dietary patterns this time. They didn't, they didn't want to focus on individual foods as much. This food is bad, that food is bad. They wanted to have that complete plate. They wanted to have chicken and grapes. They wanted to have uh, a, a balanced combination, what we would think of as a total plate. Um, within that, they looked at combinations of food and the, cumulat of the cumulative effect of food ingredients, food on that plate, whole foods on that plate, to, uh, for us to live a healthy lifestyle and to reduce our chances of progressive disease. Okay, so as a meat scientist, one of the bad news that came out of the Dietary Guidelines report was that, um, that they, they had a hard time identifying what was meat. Now, maybe many of us have a pretty good idea in our head what is meat, but is chicken meat? Or is chicken a vegetable? You know, no, chicken is, chicken is neither a vegetable nor a meat, according to the USDA. Chicken is poultry. It is a muscle food. So see where the confusion comes in when you got a bunch of eggheads in the room trying to read the, the research? So classification of meat, total meat consumption, which I'll show you a slide in a little bit, has actually gone up if you include chicken consumption in there. But if you break it down into processed meats, red meats, red meats which include pork, beef, lamb, that consumption has either held steady as it has in pork or declined as it has in beef. So they had a hard time identifying what was meat and when they came out with their summary, of course, why, vegetables, you know, we have to have a diet higher in vegetables, moderate in alcohol, so there was some potential good news there, um, lower in red and processed meats, moderate to strong evidence that says intake of red and processed meats was identified as having a, a detrimental effect, a bad effect on there. But however, I want to point out this little thing right there. That was a footnote. They footnote their recommendation that we should eat less meat and processed meat by saying, yeah, maybe you should eat less, but research has shown that it can be part of a healthy diet. So there are some inconsistencies in there. And when you have a huge report like this, there's, you're bound to have some inconsistencies in there. But this got uh, uh, people in the red meat interest industry pretty ticked off. Okay, they were, you know, they were ready to, to get out there and fight to get lean meats kept in the guidelines for healthy Americans. And so the crusade began. Um, we're bombarded by media. I mean, I've got a series of Time magazine covers here. So once upon a time, should we be a vegetarian? Okay, should we have a meat-free diet? Should we be vegan? Um, next, well, maybe we shouldn't be a vegetarian, maybe meat isn't so bad, so what really makes us fat? So there was a period of time when uh, the Atkins diet or some of these low carbohydrate diets, they were all the rage. And so we started asking the question, what really makes us fat? 
And then all of a sudden, maybe you can't see this, it's a little, little blurry, but eat butter, um, why we were wrong about these types of fat. That's a pretty definitive statement up there on, on Time Magazine. They're not just asking the question, like the previous one, they're saying why scientists went wrong. That's pretty definitive. I don't, I don't know if we can be that definitive in science. So now all of a sudden, animal products, butter, eggs, meat, poultry, um, are coming back into vogue. They're, it's okay, they're, they're not as unhealthy as we thought. But then, we focus on the real cost of food and the whole sustainability issue comes in there. So that was a big function, the Dietary Guidelines Committee, uh, the Scientific Advisory Group, for the first time in history, had inserted a social component to this. And they had said that the main reason that they wanted us to eat less meat, even though the footnote said it could be part of a healthy diet, but they downgraded it for the reason of sustainability, that, uh, which is a very hot topic, especially in the beef industry, with regard to the, the uh, uh, um, natural resources available for producing a pound of beef or a pound of red meat. So then the discussion now to brings meat back down again. Maybe we're going to think about this even more. So then the World Health Organization and the um, international cancer researchers came out and said that processed meats will cause cancer. There is strong evidence that red meat probably will cause cancer. So now the meat scientists and the meat industry are all, oh no, again. So it's bad news again. So the interesting thing about this, this organization that, that, that evaluates the risk of things very rarely evaluates foods, food products. So this was one of the few times that they've done that. So processed meats fell into the same category as sunshine. And I had to go out and, and do a few interviews when this, this came out. And the reporter asked me, well, how much bacon can I eat? before I get colorectal cancer. And I said, that's an impossible question to answer. Because how much sunshine can you run around naked outside before you're gonna, your critical limit and you're gonna get a, a skin cancerous lesion? You know, it's an impossible question to answer. The probably causes cancer where red meat is, is in, is in the same category for risk as a hairdresser and work in the night shift. So those are the type of, of health, healthful things they evaluated. So to put it into perspective, um, you know, a lot of things can, this is a complex deal. This whole idea of diet is very complex. Do you know why it's complex? Because all of you are complex. You know, how many are people, there's hundreds of people here, hundreds of individuals, each one of you has a different environmental experience, each one of you has different genetics. Each one of you has had a different interaction of your genetics with your environment, with the food you eat, and that has made you what you are now and your susceptibility to disease or not susceptibility, susceptibility to disease. It's a very complex thing. Here's those graphs I was telling you about when we look at the, the decline in consumption. You can see broilers, that's chicken. That is steadily increased. Why is chicken consumption increased when beef consumption has declined? Price is part of it. Back here in the 1990s, 80s, that's when chicken took off. What happened here? The low fat trends came then. And so beef was considered to be high in saturated fat. So the consumption patterns for red meat started to decline. White meat, breast meat just took off for chicken. So all of that increased. What else we got going on here? Similar, in the early 80s, late 70s, take a look at this. We start to see this steady increase in obesity rates for older people. They're starting to get in there. So the arrows point out some breakpoints in there. So you guys have probably seen, especially if you're affiliated with uh, nutrition classes and things like that, you've seen these graphs before. You've heard on the news about how America is becoming larger, more obese. Um, and these graphs certainly show that. And it's not just in the older adults, it's also in younger adults. If you look here at this line of, 
of uh, 12 to 19 year olds. These ones out here, so here's the line for two year olds. These guys that were recorded here are now out here. So something happened, something's going on that has triggered obesity, but it's inversely related to the uh, red meat consumption. It parallels chicken consumption. So chicken is what's making us obese. Okay, any questions? I'm done, that's it. <laughs> now we can't take that as a scientist. Um, it's convenient for us to pick and choose those parallels to, if I am anti-chicken, I can pick and choose and talk that, drive that home, and then a number of you will get up to the microphone and totally pick apart that argument. So we can't do that. Just like the anti-red meat, it's very hard to draw the negative correlation scientifically with an increase in obesity. So how do we figure these things out? It's not just in America. This slide right here shows worldwide we've seen an increase in girth around the world. And the most interesting country on here to me is Chile. Look at the rapid increase in arguably what we might call more of a developing country. So how are people um, that maybe aren't as affluent, don't have as much disposable income for food as we do in the United States and in Great Britain, how is it that they're becoming obese? How is it that poor people who can hardly afford food in impoverished areas of Mexico are obese? How is it that in the United States, impoverished areas on uh, American Indian reservations, we see an epidemic of obesity that leads to diabetes, prediabetes, metabolic syndrome? So impoverished areas are becoming obese. Why? That doesn't make logic sense. If you can barely get enough calories into you, how do you get obese? It's all about calories, isn't it? Can't be just about calories. So chronic disease progression. Here if I'm Al Gore, I'm gonna call this the hockey stick. Look at this, the diagnosis of number of cases of diabetes, and then the percent of the population with diabetes. This was out in 2006. Here's some 2011 data from the uh, American Diabetics Association. 18.8 million diabetics in 2011. So now we're way out here. That's 8.3% of the US population in 2011. 7 million, they say, are undiagnosed. We have a new diagnosis called pre-diabetes. You aren't insulin resistant, but you're borderline on that, okay? That means 79 million are thought to be pre-diabetic. This is from the, AD, the Diabetic Association. So this, is, this isn't some, some bias thing. So when we look at that, we add those up, that's almost 50% of our population that are diabetic or pre-diabetic. What the heck is going on? Again, the question mark. How does this happen? How do we determine what is causing that? 50%, that's one in two people in the United States are on their way to becoming a full-blown diabetic. So what makes us fat? What makes us diabetic? What, uh, what's the whole deal? What are, what are some things? You know, we got Junior on the couch here. Picture says a thousand words. So we can be real critical of all this. We've got um, the chips, the soda, the remote control. So is it red meat? Is it animal products? Is it eggs? Is it dairy? Is it the fast food? Is it the McDonald's value meal there that we see? Is it total calories? Total calories in? Is it sedentary lifestyle style? It's probably maybe all of the above, a combination of things. But again, there's, I don't know, 300 people here. 300 individuals, how do we tease that out? How do we, how do we tease out all the noise? If I put all of you on a, in a, on a study and a dietary intervention, an exercise intervention, I've got a range in ages, I've got males and females. Is a 19-year-old male gonna react to food the same way a 72-year-old female is? Oh, hell no, geez. 
they, but they get grouped into a lot of studies because it's hard to get people to be on a diet study and to stick to that, di that diet. So we might end up with a study that gets international attention that had 25 people, males and females, blacks and whites, uh, different races, ranging in age from 19 to 70. And we make dietary recommendations from those types of studies. And probably we shouldn't. Maybe we can use them as a screening process. I put this slide in here because I wanted to show you the average consumption of uh, pop. So it's about a 16 ounce bottle of Coke like that. Okay, So that's 52 grams of sugar in that bottle of Coke. And that's down, actually. That's down in consumption from what it used to be. But what's up in double digits is energy drinks. So there's your monster drink. It's roughly about the same size as that Coke, right? What's it say here? Uh, total sugar, 27 grams. But check out the servings. <laughs> There's three servings there. See how they tricked you? See how they tricked you? There's three servings, so do the math. It's 81 grams of sugar in that energy drink. And that's sugar. It says it's sugar right there. It's not whole grain. <laughs> it's not carbohydrates. It's sugar. Okay? And that's going to have an effect on your physiology. That's why it's an energy drink, because <laughs> it has sugar in it and other stuff. Do we need energy? I say this to my mom all the time. My mom, who is 77 years old, drinking her Gatorade. And I say, Mom, why do you drink Gatorade? Well, because I, I need the electrolytes. And I said, Gatorade was made for elite level athletes that are sweating in the Florida sun. I'm sorry, Mom, you're past your elite level athlete date. <laughs> and it's got sugar in it because sugar replenishes the glycogen in your working muscles. And that's part of your physiology. Here's, here's lunch for most people. This is, a, this is a problem with the United States. And that's why the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee looked at whole foods. Because whole foods maybe are kind of scarce. Do you think the general public considers a salad the healthy alternative? When I'm on a diet, how many people turn to the salad? How many of you have been out to supper or out to dinner with somebody? I'll just have a salad. I'm trying to lose weight. OK? <laughs> and she's exactly right. This could be a healthy meal. We've got, we've got leafy green vegetables that contain our fiber. They've got antioxidants in them. We've got some fruit in there. We've got some. Um, uh, blueberries for good prostate health. We've got what's conspicuously absent, though, is maybe a source of protein. So you no know, lentils or beans, uh, legumes could be in there to help round things out. Uh, slices of chicken or sirloin steak or something like that would make that a complete meal, a plate, a complete plate. All right. The general public, though, when they're dieting to lose weight, is going to ignore that part. Because those parts, maybe they'll put some beans on there, but they're going to ignore the, the muscle food part because in the back of their head, there's a little voice saying, you shouldn't eat that. You're trying to lose weight. Okay. Is that a healthy diet, a healthy meal? Anybody ever been late for class, run out and grab that whole grain bagel? There's a whole grain bagel. That particular brand of whole grain bagel has got 12 grams of protein in it. Protein's all the rage right now. We didn't have a lot of protein on here. We were deficient in protein in that meal. But here I got 12 grams of protein. Awesome. Are all proteins created equal? No, OK. So you in the, in the swine club, you guys that have taken uh, Nutrition classes, either on the human side or on the animal side. On the animal side, we treat the amino acids in a protein as an individual nutrient. Lysine is an individual nutrient. Here, that label says crude protein, 12 grams. It's whole grain, so let's consider it that whole grain portion of a swine diet. We have to combine legumes and grains to balance the protein. So if we put some, if, if we wanted to stay vegetarian, we could put some bean 
paste on there or some type of vegetarian option that came from a legume, or we could put salmon on there to, to round it up. We could put cream cheese on there so that we can balance out the amino acids in there. But just the grain, we're out of whack for our amino acids because the protein digestibility in there is going to be anywhere from 38 to 42 percent. So now if I want my essential amino acids, I've got to eat two and a half of those bagels. And now I've just bumped up my calories, which doesn't concern me as much as the amount of starch I just ate, which is going to affect my physiology and change my body type. Ever felt out of sorts, acting like Betty White? You got to have a Snickers. How many of you made a Snickers bar meal today? We've all done it. We've done it. You're in a hurry. You grab a Snickers. It's got peanuts in it. That's better than the bagel, huh? Maybe. I don't know. Bagels whole grain. Oh, I'm so confused. I'm going to get sun chips. <laughs> sun chips are whole grain. I'll have my sun chips with my Snickers. That's, that's my meal. My point is in the United States, we snack. At least two meals out of the day, we're snackers. They're not meals. They're snacks. Maybe if you're lucky when you go home at night, you have a, a nice plate with your salad, with your, with your chicken strips on it, or your sirloin, or your fish with it, and you balance everything out. You've got some fruit, you've got some vegetables, you've got some, some meat. That's, that's um, the whole plate. But two-thirds of the day, three-quarters of the day, you're out of balance. You're not getting your essential amino acid. So there's a lot we can learn from hog producers. If hog producers fed their pigs the way we eat most of the time, they would be not sustainable, which we all know is bad. They would not grow efficiently, and they would be fat. We have seen that because here's some data. Here's six studies. All of them were balanced so they're deficient in one amino acid. One portion of a protein, that's lysine. That's the first limiting amino acid. If we are deficient, humans have the same limiting amino acid. If we're deficient in lysine, pigs are a great model for humans. If we're deficient in one amino acid, those pigs are going to end up with fat in between their muscle. We call it marbling in agriculture. In the medical community, they call it intramuscular triglyceride and it's a, a factor associated with metabolic syndrome. So when we take an MRI and we look inside the muscle or the liver, we have fatty liver and we have fatty muscle. Good in a pig that we want to eat pork chops out of, bad in a person who wants to live a healthy lifestyle. Okay? That's just one amino acid deficiency. So if we're eating that whole grain, we're listening to the dietary guidelines, eat more whole grain, eat more whole grain, but if we don't balance that out, we can do that. You know, I'm, uh, the majority of the world is vegetarian. It's beans and rice, or it's beans and corn. They balance it out, just like we do uh, in a swine ration. And we've known that in agriculture for 100 years, that we have to treat amino acids as the true nutrient, not crude protein. Okay? And that is why impoverished nations that can only grab the corn are out of balance and they become obese and they end up with some of these diseases of modern civilization. Pig's a great model for humans for many reasons. Um, I had a good friend that was severely burned and one of the first grafts they put on him for skin was skin from a pig. You know, it's a temporary graft. Uh, pigs are roughly the same size as us. They, their organs are the same size. We can study muscle development, fat deposition, respiratory disorders. Oh, I got a whole list. Digestive, liver, nervous, reproductive. All of these, if we group them all together, we can study how diet affects disease progression. Because what that omnivore, just like us, pigs are omnivores, what that omnivore eats is going to affect its release of insulin the similar way it does us. Remember, it wasn't too long ago that diabetics were using porcine insulin, so it's compatible there. So the way diet affects that pig is going to be similar to us. Pigs are a great model because now I can get 50 pigs that can all be female, they can all have the same dad, and they can all have the same birthday. 
where am I going to find 50 females with the same dad on the human population? You know, that's, I think that's illegal, actually. <laughs> so they make a great model and they help us weed out all the variation that's in this room. So we can screen certain things and we can answer some questions. So what is high quality protein? It's not just me preaching uh, amino acids as a, as a nutrient. The FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, the other branch of the UN uh, that is recommending counting amino acids as a individual nutrient, uh, different from the one that said not to eat red meat and processed meats. But they're saying to look at amino acids as individual nutrients. And the way to do that is they're updating how they classify the quality of a protein, and that's digestible indispensable amino acid score, or DS. So essentially what they do is they want to do it in humans, but if you're going to be in my human study, I either have to put a, a hole in your side into your small intestine so I can take your poop out and see how well you digested the food I, ate you, I gave to you. Anybody want to do that? We'll give you a hundred bucks. <laughs> okay, since there's no volunteers, what I'm going to do, maybe I'll give you 50 bucks if you let me stick a tube up your nose and fish all the way down and get my sample. So, no, no takers on that one either. So that's why they use pigs, because we, we can, this is, it's, we can get lots of utility out of the pigs for different dietary studies by putting that called a duodenal cannula in there to take these samples. So we can draw those out and then we can look at uh, different grains. We can look at quinoa. We can feed quinoa and we know the amount of amino acids that are going in and we can take the digesta and figure out what got digested out of there. And it's a much more accurate way than the way they used to do it by just measuring what went in the mouth and what got pooped out. Okay? So to change that means that we need a worldwide research effort to figure out maybe does, well done, does a well done steak have less absorbed amino acids than a medium or a rare steak? That's an important question because we've seen an association with well done meat and digestive problems or colon cancer. So we need to ask that question. Maybe it has something to do with individuals who eat well done meat, which you shouldn't do, just because from a palatability standpoint. But if, you, if, you, if the processing causes a reduction in the availability of amino acids over a prolonged period of time, combined with lots of other stuff, does that lead to the potential for cancer? These are things that need to be studied. Also, we don't look at life stages. The, we just started, the dietary guidelines just started giving recommendations for two-year-olds. So there is, we know this in animal agriculture too, there's different stages of life where you need higher concentrations of certain nutrients and as you get older, you, you switch, you know. So life stages are a big deal. So there is a huge research effort going on to classify foods and protein sources, including animal products, going on right now. Um, I want to show you this slide, and it's going to take a little bit of explaining. So um, this is foods that are considered high-quality protein, okay? So this, the first bar here is calories per total protein in the food. So that's like that bagel that had 12 grams of protein. So how many calories does it take to get um, the daily recommended dose of, of protein, all right? So the green bar here, so the lower it is, the better the ratio of calories to protein. With me on that? So this high ratio here is, see here's beef, whey protein, whey protein isolate out of dairy, which we add to a lot of, of meal replacement bars and things like that is the lowest, most available. But as we get out here, the yellow bar is how much 
you would have to eat in calories to get the essential amino acids from there. So see how the crude protein, we can reach that in a certain amount of, of uh, calories, but to get the nutrients we need from essential amino acids, we, we eat too many calories then. So yeah, I'm literally eating like a pig, okay? Pigs will self-regulate themselves. If we give them a deficient diet, they're gonna overeat because their internal something tells them that their nutrients aren't met. So they will overeat a low lysine food, they'll overeat corn, and they'll get fat in the process, but they'll meet their amino acid needs, but they're gonna overeat calories, they're gonna overeat starch, not necessarily calories. So maybe this one helps out a little better. Um, here's quinoa, I have a triathlete friend who is um, kind of foregone, he's a clean eater. You've heard of clean eating? Okay, he's a clean eater, so he doesn't, doesn't really eat beef anymore, and he's um, still my friend. We <laughs> still talk, but he eats a lot of quinoa, and I said, I tried telling him about essential amino acids, because he's an elite level athlete now. He bikes, he swims, he runs, and he needs that high quality protein to rebuild the protein that he destroys when he's working out and running and doing all his events. He's rebuilding muscle. But in order to do that, he's gonna have to eat so much more of these high protein vegetable sources than he would from an animal source. So what we really need to do is, I'm not up here telling everybody's supposed to eat a 16 ounce steak every meal of the day, what we need to do is find out through these studies is maybe we only need two ounces per meal of, of meat. We don't really know what our essential amino acids are for humans. We need to do that research. So here's some crazy crap that I did at NDSU when using pigs as a model. So the first study is we were comparing the just totally unrealistic diet of feeding all ground beef versus a vegetarian diet, which was corn and soybeans, that was balanced um, for proper nutrition for a pig. So what I had was, um, there's my objective, which is what I just told you, and see, I blame everything on the government. You know, here's, here's our old food guide pyramid that got fired, and you look at the base of the pyramid here, six to 11 servings of rice, pasta, cereal, so, refined carbohydrates. Those are, those are, in the newest guidelines, those are consume in moderation. And that's just changed in 15, 20 years. That's a complete turnaround of the pyramid. Isn't that crazy? So there's, you know, we make these kinds of discoveries and with regard to diet, no wonder consumers are confused. So it's all about manipulating insulin. So the, you guys know that the major use of insulin is to lower our blood glucose. And the way that that does that is this. So these little red dots, that's glucose in the blood, okay? Here comes insulin, it's being released to the high blood glucose. It's gonna bind its insulin receptor on the muscle cell. It's gonna cause these glucose transport molecules to come to the cell surface. Now all the red dots are gonna go in. Insulin's gonna help bind them together as glycogen. So after working out, you eat your, drink your Gatorade, it replaces the glucose that was in your muscle as glycogen, and things are cool, okay? But my theory is that the reason we have a pre-diabetic diagnosis now is because the body doesn't become resistant all at once. The muscle becomes insulin resistant. So that means these receptors for insulin downregulate. They're not there anymore. That's like going up to a locked door that has no keyhole. You might have the key, but you can't get in because there's no place to unlock the door. So this unlocks the door to let the glucose in, but that's not there anymore because the muscle is already saturated. So now we're back to exercise. If you're sedentary, if you're out of balance, eating bagels all day, your muscles are gonna get saturated and they say, no way, man, I'm full. I can't take any more glycogen. So they downregulate, and now the insulin receptors are still viable on the fat cell. So blood glucose goes back to the liver, gets converted to triglycerides. So now your blood triglycerides are up. You start to develop non-alcoholic fatty liver disease because you're converting to 
uh, that triglyceride. Some of them are going to stay in the liver. They're going to go back out with high insulin. Insulin is going to bind to the fat cell and it's going to deposit fat in the fat cell like it did glucose when everything was working normally. So you keep eating your dietary pattern, you keep doing your sedentary lifestyle, you're eating yourself fatter and fatter. Are you with me on that? Kind of, kind of get it? Um, when you're trying to exploit this in terms of dieting, when you eat low sugar, eat low starch, you eat foods, uh, high in fiber, like um, vegetables, green vegetables, things like the, the stuff without the added sugar, meat, it's kind of, it's the theory of Atkins, but it's refined some more. So they were on the right track, but we can't just eat a high protein diet. Okay, it has to be, because the high protein diet, if you have too much protein, it can convert to glucose, and I'll show you how that happens here. Um, so if we want to lose body fat, all of these hormones, growth hormone, uh, adrenocorticotropic hormone, glucocorticoid, these are stress hormones, the ones that aren't as dark. So when insulin is low, we have to raise our blood sugar again just to keep our brain going and everything, and we'll take that, we can take the energy from our fat stores. And these hormones are really good at burning body fat, including growth hormone. Glucagon is what regulates our blood glucose in between meals. So glucose is gone, glucagon helps release it from the liver, and the liver is what gets us between it. But if our liver is saturated, if we chronically have elevated insulin, all these guys are down-regulated, and it's a perfect storm for storing fat. So here's that whole series of events. Chronic, we're eating, overeating, starches, sugar, uh, hyperglycemia, hyperinsulinemia, so glucose is high, insulin is going to be high, um, energy saturation in the muscle and the liver, fat cells are viable, we're eating ourselves fatter. Once the uh, uh, re uh, receptors on fat downregulate, now we're diagnosis of diabetic. So introducing these 10 pigs from my first study. Um, the, here's the background they came from. They were all uh, born on the same day, all had the same dad. So we had five in each group and we got them big. We started them on their diet after we fed them to a point where they had three centimeters, so an inch and a half of back fat, external fat. Then we put them on their diet. One group got only ground beef with calcium added. We, we, we put the analysis of the ground beef into the swine nutrition calculator and they were just efficient in calcium, so we put calcium carbonate on there and we let them eat as much as they want. The other diet was 70% um, corn, 15% vegetable oil, uh, and then some more um, fat as DDGSs, so roughly there's about 20% fat in the control diet, that was the vegetarian diet. We balanced the corn for amino acids by adding soybean meal to it. All right, so they got their complete amino acids there. Um, it's, it's got that different kind of fat, and we let them eat all they wanted to. Uh, we took blood draws every three, every month, for three months. Uh, we looked at their blood chemistry we, with regard to, you know, um, cholesterol and all the other chemistry, uh, pH, um, et cetera. So here's the take-home message. If you look across here, there was a treatment effect. The ones in red, the red line is ground beef, red meat. So red, green is vegetables. So they overate compared to the, the, the meat eaters ate more of the, in fact, if you look, this is in kilograms. So the average consumption, I had one of the pigs that ate almost 20 pounds of ground beef a day. So I know what you're saying. You're saying, yeah, but ground beef is mostly water. You know, even when it's cooked, it's mostly water. It was 40% fat. There wasn't a lot of water in there. So we calculated how much calories they ate. So the ground beef ate more calories as well, not just quantity, more calories. And over time, so the percent change, see how they were growing at the same rate? They continued, this is their body weight, they continued to gain weight even though they were mature, but the ground beef who ate more calories gained less weight proportionally over time. How about their body fat? The first month there was no change in body fat and then they proportionally gained less fat over time. So the way we did that, we did it as a percent from day zero 
to see how much change there was. So calories matter to a certain extent, I guess, because they were eating, a, they were eating an extreme amount. Why were they eating so much ground beef? The, the, the nutritionist that I worked with, I was expecting some big long answer. It was Hans Stein. He used to be on faculty here, and he said, "Well, Eric, he's from," he's, he says, "I guess they just, I guess they just liked it." You know, I was expecting some big scientific answer, <laughs> and they did like it, and they were very mellow. They were a cool group, and they they moved a lot more than the other ones. And I wish we would have had video cameras to quantify that. So that's just an observational thing on my. Here's their blood chemistry for cholesterol. To me, the take-home thing is here. Sure, we raised total cholesterol. HDL, the so-called good cholesterol, stayed the same between groups. LDL, the so-called bad cholesterol, was higher in the ground beef group. So you're thinking heart attack, you know, all that fat. Triglycerides, there was no difference between a group that one pig ate up to 20 pounds of, so what's, 40% of 20, that's how much fat that was eaten daily of red meat fat. So we collected the aortas and we did what's called an oil red stain and it would show up if there was plaque. Here's all the pigs that we had aortas collected from, these samples. In neither diet, there was no signs of, of arthrosclerosis or plaque buildup. So that flies in the face of the greasy burger, heart attack on a plate kind of thing at least in pigs, in this study, okay? These are pigs still. Um, insulin, if you look here, there was no difference over time, which was kind of disappointing. I wanted to see a, a, a difference in insulin. Glucose was higher in the group that ate fat and protein. So this really surprised me. And so when you think about that, there, those amino acids, that's so much protein that the body has to do something with it. And there are certain amino acids that can convert to glucose, and that's exactly what happened. So this is an unrealistic diet for humans to just eat ground beef and chalk, essentially, so don't do that, okay? But maybe you could eat this in combination on your whole plate. Leptin is a satiety hormone. The, in theory, it's produced by fat cells, so the higher, the more fat, the more leptin is produced and it sends a signal to the brain, dude, stop eating, okay? So we saw that the ground beef toward the end, we saw a treatment by day effect. So toward the end, that leptin was up telling them to slow down their consumption, which they did, if you saw that in the previous graph. Porcine growth hormone, no different. One of the big criticisms of red meat is it causes an increase in insulin-like growth factor, which uh, many tumor cells have IGF receptors for growth. So they think that's the link between uh, red meat consumption and cancer is that it leads for us to increase IGF. If you're an athlete, you look for ways to raise your IGF because it's anabolic and, and raises your muscle mass. But I was surprised by this too, the ground beef, was significantly lower for the production of IGF, an anabolic hormone. So um, our objective too was to look at the muscle cells to see if they actually uh, downregulated insulin receptors. So here's a gracilis muscle, and they're, all the insulin receptors in this muscle that's right here on there, um, there are fewer receptors than in the ground beef group. See how that's just saturated with insulin receptors. And so this is a muscle of power. And that was good to see from our standpoint. So in that gracilis muscle, there was double the receptors, so making them much more insulin sensitive. And that's what we wanted. We wanted to be able to have more insulin sensitivity because that will lead to a decrease in the potential for diseases of, of modern civilization. Uh, I have a collaborator from Utah State that the, the designed a diet based on what the average American eats. It's called the Total Western Diet, and he gets it from the National Health and Nutrition Evaluation Survey. And so he put together this diet with ingredients, all this yummy stuff, uh, butter, olive oil, lard, beef tallow, and this is 
the macro and micronutrients of what the average American eats. So the 50th percentile from age 2 to 72. And if you look at the carbohydrates here, half of them are from raw sugar. This diet was delicious, by the way. Uh, when we tasted it, it was just like a sweet cake. But we switched in the, the other treatment, we switched calorie for calorie. We took all the sugar out and replaced it with ground beef. Here's what happened. When they were two months old, that's when we started them on the diet. The blue line is the total Western diet, what the average American eats. They stunted their growth. Look at the, by the time they finished, after 91 days on test, they were averaging 61 pounds heavier. Here's what they look like. These are litter mates. We paired them up. This, this wasn't a deal where they got all they could eat. It wasn't a full buffet here. This was, we fed them at 3.8% of their body weight. Okay, so it was isocaloric, the way we mixed it up. And then if this pig that was on the total Western diet, if it was eating 3.7% of its body weight, that's what we fed this one. So as they started to get heavier, these gals, they were all women, they were all women, they were all gilts, females born on the same day, same dad. They were a different breed than we had in the other study, but they were Berkshires. They started to take off, so they were consuming more, but on a per body weight basis, they were getting the same calories on a body weight basis. Because we didn't want to stunt them, so we did it on a percent body weight basis. Now what's interesting, you see some of the difference in here. These Berkshire pigs are known for very black uh, hide. See the thinning here? See the, the, basically what happened, the total Western diet, they lost their hair and they got pimples. And they got stunted growth. So think about some of the ads you see on TV, what there's ads for. You know, the, the grow your hair back ads for men and women, the, the, uh, proactive for acne. So this, this paralleled what we see the average American, you know, some of these, these less chronic conditions that are affiliated with what we eat. And again, hindsight is 2020. If we would have done some type of image analysis so we could quantify the difference here, but it was visible, it's totally visible. So over time, the, this is loin muscle area, so the, the cross-sectional area of their muscle along the spine here, they continue to get larger where the, there's sarcopenia going on here. They're, they're, they stopped growing muscle, the ones that were on the total Western diet. They continued to deposit fat, whereas it was more level in the ground beef supplemented group for depositing fat. They still put on some more fat over time. Their total fat-free lean, look at this, increased Fat free lean, this is your percent body fat, or the inverse of that, percent muscle in the total pounds of muscle over the uh, three months they were on test. Just flatlined for the ones that were eaten, what the average American eats. Now check this out. These are litter mates. So there they are alive, pimply and bald. Here they are over here with an average. These are litter mates. They had the, they were born at, they were born from the same womb. Look at the difference in external fat. Look at, look at this. This is misshapen. They're, the muscles stop growing. It's, we're going to do the insulin. We haven't done the insulin receptors on there yet. But if I were a betting man, I would say that there's going to be multiple insulin receptors on here. And this muscle is insulin resistant. The fat isn't. And that whole intramuscular triglyceride in there, so we were feeding that intramuscular triglyceride when the muscle wasn't taking any more glucose. So that's a big deal. So now do, can we translate this to humans? You know, we, I sure would like to get on my soapbox and say, you are eating crap, you're eating the wrong stuff. But we can't do that yet. So what about exercise? You know, it's a complex deal, uh, body composition. So we did an exercise study, and this one is going to just blow your mind. Okay? <laughs> so we had pigs, and we walked them around our swine wing three times a week. And we did that while they were pregnant. 
So it was pregnant sows. The whole idea, this was a welfare study. We wanted with, with uh, swine production systems going to um, uh, community pens away from gestation stalls. We wanted to look at the welfare of exercise for pregnant sows. And so we, three days a week, 30 minutes, we put little piggy pedometers on them and we counted the number of steps they took. And um, this is intrafascicular space. So see here, this is a, a muscle uh, from the semitendinosus. Again, this is another muscle of the hind leg. Uh, it's your hamstring muscle. So all these little circles, here's connective tissues for the fasciculi, but within here, as this matures, this was a, a newborn. And as these mature, this is where the fat's gonna be deposited in there. So this was a newborn, these are females. This was the, this was the muscle from a female born to a non-exercised sow. Look at all that marbling at birth. Now flash back to what I was telling you about the muscle being insulin resistant. So was this, well I gotta back up even further. So with that high, if, the, if that sow was eating corn and the starch is converted to, to glucose, that glucose is gonna cross the placenta. And at 40 days of age, that little piggy pancreas, the fetal pancreas is already producing insulin. The maternal insulin can't cross the placenta. So the uh, assault of glucose is having an effect on the developing piglet on the developing fetus. So when it's born, perhaps it's already set up for that stunted growth that we see. Now this could be devastating. If that happens at birth for humans, can we reverse it then? That if you're born with your muscle cells being insulin resistant, can we reverse that? So there's no end for research to do here. But uh, this uh, fetal programming, fetal development, epigenetics is what it's called. Man, that's a great area for you students to get into. Super cool stuff. Um, so why? And why was it only in the females? The males, you know, the, the boars, the little boars that were born, we didn't see any difference in that intrafascicular space. They didn't have fatty muscles at birth. What's the deal? I don't know. Over time, we followed the offspring and the non-exercised pigs got fatter quicker. So there is, a, there's an exercise thing, but there's an exercise of mom. There's a thing with what mom ate. And we already talked at the outset that there's a cultural attitude to how we eat. So maybe genetics isn't as cracked up as we once thought. Maybe genetics is being mistaken for a culture of food. You know, Italian food or Norwegian food goes, great grandma did it this way, mom did it this way, now I'm doing it this way. And they did it that way when they were pregnant. And if it was messed up, it can have a cumulative effect on the offspring. Evolution, if you will. So I will entertain any questions that you have. Oh, thank you. <laughs> let me give you the mic so we can all hear. So, so am I on? Okay. You're on. So, you know, you see advertised on TV about. Um, um, diet programs where they send the food to your house mm -hmm. and it's supposed to be pre-packaged, pre-proportioned so you know just how many, uh, how much you're supposed to eat every day. Is there something to, is there some science then obviously behind what they put in those packages to make everything the, the most efficient? Yeah, absolutely. And it, again, it gets that whole meal throughout the day. So uh, I just heard a, a a researcher from Duke University that talked to a committee that I'm on for the National Pork Board, and she came and talked about her studies that she's doing feeding muscle foods to uh, individuals 50 years and older. So there's a condition called sarcopenia, and it looks just like those pigs that were on that whacked out diet, that they, as people get, as they age, their muscle mass shrinks, 
and their body fat gets bigger. So she has been an ongoing research project that's going to go on a year now, where she gave pork protein, which included ham, a processed meat, pork chops, and some ground pork, and they, their, their, their only instruction was they had to eat 30 grams of protein from pork three times a day. And they did nothing else, no exercise or nothing, and they lost body fat. And even though exercise wasn't part of it, they had to record if they, they did any change in activity, and they start to become more active. So that could be attributed to two things. They're losing weight from the fat loss, or maybe their joint health is improving, which could be a combination of both. So it's a really cool study. So at one time, I know my grandma was just living on Triscuit crackers and you know margarine, I think, because they, they were saying not to eat uh, a lot of animal protein. And now we're kind of seeing maybe that wasn't such good advice. So yeah, the prepackaged meals give us that whole plate and if you want to be vegetarian, like I said, they know the science to combine the right things. So you're not out of balance for your amino acids or whatever else. So, yeah, it's a, it's a neat way and it's, it's very American now, you know, nobody cooks. But we're all interested in food. It's, it's a good idea. A lot of grocery stores have takeout like that now too. Good question. Thank you. Um, thank you. That was, a, that was a really interesting talk, but have you ever looked at the effect of diet on the microbiota of those animals? Yeah, that's, that's a great point. That's a great point, and that's another place we're going to move on to. Uh, what he's, he's asking about the microbiome, and again, on TV we see uh, probiotics are a big rage. So probiotics and yogurt products are, are the big things, but kefir and kubacha, and saying that wrong probably, but it's to inoculate your gut flora with healthy bacteria. And this is another great area for you folks to get into research on because now we're seeing that the microorganisms that occupy our digestive tract are going to be treated as a separate endocrine organ. So there's been research in, in rodents that if you take uh, the microflora, the poop, from a skinny rat and in feed it to the obese rat, the obese rat will lose body fat just by eating the skinny rat's poop. It's crazy. So can we do that in humans? Can we do that in... Uh, I know there's some research going on at Montana State University with, with sheep where they're looking at high-performing uh, lambs, ewes, and inoculating their rumen contents, their gut contents in in other sheep to see if they can transfer the high efficiency. So this is, yeah, this is a great, this is the frontier of research right there, the microbiome. It's the, it's the new frontier in, in research for health. It's very cool. Has there ever been any studies on diet and longevity on pigs? Um, not that I'm aware of. The, the one tricky thing, the bad thing about pigs as a model, how many of you have seen Hogzilla? You know who Hogzilla is? You um, ask me, pigs keep growing. And those pigs that I had in my ground beef study, some of them got over 700 pounds, and then that's, a, that's like a Hereford. I had, to weigh them on the, I had to weigh them on the cattle scale. So they'll keep growing and growing. So yeah, the, I, that was supposed to be a six month study but I couldn't afford to be longer than six months. So for a whole productive lifetime would be very expensive. So, but yeah, long-term studies in, in animal models, a year would be a long time. So, yeah, it's a good idea, but I need somebody to pay for it. I'm, I'm just curious, you know, we, we got apps for everything, so you would think there would be an app or something like that. We've, we've got rations calculated yeah. for optimum growth in pigs, and you can, you know, I suppose you can accustom that ration to what kind of gains you want. Mm -hmm. So why can't we have some kind of an app that, that you plug in this kind of food that you're eating, strawberries or pork or whatever, and this many grams, and it figures out your balanced ration for the day? No, they have them for your, that sinks into your Fitbit too. 
So it combines the exercise and your diet, and you type that in. But what I'm arguing is that we don't have a clue of what we're supposed to eat. We don't, and again, we can look at swine as a model, but those Berkshires, old-fashioned genetics, we're not going to feed them the same way we feed a very heavy muscle patron. So now if we look at race, there's, there's differences just on race with regard to body type and the reaction to food. So one size does not fit all in animals or in humans. So we play the, the, the average and it doesn't work out so well. I have an Excel spreadsheet that I took for a long time ago that I can punch in and it tells me how much of a protein food and this, that, and the other thing that I can eat back when I was a bodybuilder in another <laughs> lifetime. On the one chart you had, it showed how chicken consumption has increased and beef consumption decreased, but pork consumption kind of stayed uh, at the same pace. Um, what factors are there that are preventing pork consumption from rising? Um, well, there's cultural barriers to that. So Islam, so Muslims and Jews will not eat pork because it's, it's uh, not halal, not kosher. Um, there's perceptions of, so when you look at marketing research like the National Pork Board does, there's some perceptions that pork is unclean. And so there, you know, there's those types of things and there's still lingering things about uh, pigs fed slop and stuff like that too. So they've tried to make great gains in pork consumption over time, but I don't know, it's always surprised me too because pork is barbecue and everybody loves to barbecue. So yeah, it's a great question. If you can figure that out, you'd be a hero to the pork industry. Okay. Dr. Berg, one of the, the studies I've heard you talk about is, uh, you know, the question about whether implanted beef affects uh, the puberty age of, of our young females. Would you uh, just briefly talk about that a little bit? Right. We were published in the journal Nutrition, and what we did is we, again, we had gilts all born on females because it's hard to keep intact boars. So the males, it's, we just don't do studies on males because there's no value at the end of the project because... We can't sell them. So we use females, and so we had prepubertal females, so weaned piglets, and we fed them one of four diets. So, well, we fed them a base diet. We had a low estrogen diet, so that was a corn-based diet that had no soybeans in it, because soy has higher, has high estrogenicity. So this was, I gotta back up, Bob, because this is the, the study that I did when I'm on an airplane and people ask what I do, I always get asked the question, are hormones in meat making girls reach puberty sooner? So that's this study. We tested to see if this low estrogen-based diet, which was a complete diet, like a pig diet, it just had no beans in it, and we had six of them that got a quarter pounder, a cooked quarter pounder from steers that had gotten two rounds of estrogenic implants, so growth promotants. We had natural beef that never got any growth promotants. And we had the tofu equivalent, and then just the one group that only ate the base diet. And we fed them as a percent of their body weight, so they all got 3.8% of their body weight. They all grew really well. And it was essentially a race to puberty to see if the theory that there's hormones in the meat uh, that got the the growth promotants, then the theory was that they should reach puberty sooner because of the estrogenicity. Well, they all tied. It was all the same. Even though the amount of estrogenicity of the tofu burger, the soybeans, so the tofu was 500 times more than the estrogen content of the um, natural beef, and it was like 300 and some times that of the implanted beef. And there was no difference between the natural and the um, implanted beef patties uh, at all. They were all very low. It's like a, the analogy is a blade of grass in a football field, the amount of. So myth busted, I guess it was. But the one curious thing, so we weighed all the tissues because they all went to market because they were basically market pigs. So we weighed all the tissues and the uterine weight of the tofu group was twice as much as the other treatments. So their 
there may have been an estrogenic effect on the development of the repro tract. It just wasn't significantly different. So it was, again, it was one of those observations that maybe if we had more animals in the study, we would have seen a significant difference. So there might be something to the estrogenicity thing, just not coming from the beef that we implanted. <laughs>